This is the multiple regression video on internal validation. External validation provides stronger inference than internal validation. So you should validate externally when you can and internally when you must. When you don't have another data set that can be used for external validation, you must validate internally. One form of internal validation is to break your data set into two parts. First to be used for the model development and the other for the model validation. You do exactly the same thing that you do with, with an external data set. The only difference being that you aren't able to generalize the conclusions. The other form of internal validation, one that's covered in this module, is applied when your data set isn't large enough to break into two big pieces. There's more than one approach to internal validation. I'll focus on bootstrapping. The idea behind bootstrapping is elegant. Consider for a moment the formula that says that the standard error of the mean equals the standard deviation sigma over the square root of the sample size n. This innocent little formula actually encodes one of the fundamental ideas of statistics. Sigma is the level of variation in an actual population, for example, the standard deviation of heights among 12-year-olds. Sigma can't be changed, merely estimated. So everything on the right side of the formula, the sigma and the n, are characteristics of the sample that the investigator has taken. However, statistics is all about an inference and extrapolation. Individual samples are only helpful to the degree that they can help us predict what will be observed in later studies. In our formula, we're extrapolating to what would happen if we could replicate the study in question repeated, repeatedly, in particular with the same design and the same sample size. For each replication of the study, we could calculate a mean. These means will differ from replication to replication, and thus will have a distribution of their own. This distribution will have a mean and a standard deviation. And it's, it's this last quantity that's estimated by sigma over the square root of n. So somehow, using assumptions and the power of mathematics, we've been able to use data from a single study, the estimate of sigma and the square root of n, to describe the characteristics of the sampling distribution. That is, we've been able to describe the characteristics of the distribution of means that would be observed were the sample to be repeatedly performed. I've glossed over the critical step by which the formula in question was derived, other than to state that it used assumptions in math. Unfortunately, both can be fail, can fail. Assumptions can be incorrect, and all else being equal, statisticians prefer methods with fewer assumptions rather than more. And we can't always figure out how to make the math work. Bootstrapping provides an alternative. To understand the logic behind bootstrapping, let's return to the idea of the sampling distribution. Now that it's the distribution of something for example, the mean of a sample of size 50, over repeated replications in the study. The genius behind bootstrapping is that, rather than use assumptions in math, we'll use computer powder to simulate these repeated replications. Here's how it works. For a study with 50 patients, put the name of those 50 patients into a hat, draw a name, and then, this is a crucial step, return the name into the hat. Draw again, put that name back, until you've drawn exactly 50 patients. It's highly unlikely that the sample will be identical to the, to the original. You need every name to show up exactly once for that to happen. But it is likely that the sample will be pretty similar. You can create these bootstrap samples as many times as you want. So in essence, you can replicate your experiment as many times as you want. Now that you have your bootstrap samples, do the same thing within each sample. In the original example, we calculated the mean. However, we could also calculate a multi multiple regression coefficients if we liked. We could go through a variable selection process and record which variables were retained as statistically significant. For example, taking the empirical distribution of regression coefficient using the data from each of the bootstrap samples is one way to estimate the precision of that coefficient. As another example, the percentage of times a variable shows up as statistically significant is one way to validate that the results of a variable selection application can be believed. Understanding the logic of bootstrapping can also provide you with some intuition about when, the, when this method is likely to go wrong. It doesn't work for estimating a minimum or a maximum because, for example, a maximum in any number of bootstrap samples won't be, bigger, won't be bigger than the biggest data point in the original sample. The method also assumes that the samples are representative. Bootstrapping won't cure biases in the original sample. Moreover, it flies off the handle when the original sample is small, since bootstrap samples perform poorly. 
But usually bootstrapping works, and it's a great tool when it does.